Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the course of survey of major English-speaking countries. This lecture is about the general introduction of Canada, part one. Canada has a land mass of nearly 10 million square kilometers. 998.4 million square kilometers exactly, almost as big as the whole Europe. The country's vast territory makes it the second largest country in the world in area after Russia. Canada's expansive area is abundant in forest resources and in numerous lakes. In fact, about 45% of the country is covered with forest, and the lake take up 7.6% of its land mass. Among them, the Great Lakes on the border between Canada and the United States are the largest group of freshwater lakes in the world. Canada shares with the United States Niagara Falls, one of the most spectacular natural wonders on the North American continent. In contrast to its physical size, Canada's population is very small. In accordance with the latest survey of October in 2020, Canada's population is about 38 million, about the same as the Chongqing city in our country. This paradox of having a small number of people in a very large, resource-rich area gave rise to some of the misleading perceptions people have about this country. Most people do not know very much about Canada. Mention this country, and usually one of two images will spring to mind. On the one hand, you might picture a frozen country where people live in igloos, eat fish, hunt bears, and constantly endure snow and cold. On the other, you might think Canada is a country that is just like America. Most Canadians speak American-sounding English, although if you're alert, you can tell the difference between a Canadian accent and an American one. They eat hamburgers, wear jeans, play baseball, and enjoy American television show and Hollywood movies. It is no surprise that people often assume that Canadians are just like Americans. Today, many politicians, educators, writers, sociologists, and ordinary Canadians spend a lot of time, efforts, and even money worrying about what exactly is the Canadian identity. What makes a Canadian Canadian? How is Canada different from other countries? And what does an English-speaking wheat farmer in rural Alberta have in common with a French-speaking corporate lawyer in the sophisticated city of Montreal? Or a second-generation Canadian dentist who traces his roots back to Chinese Guangdong province and has been brought up speaking Cantonese as well as English and French? This search for a national identity underlies the story of Canada. Canada, in fact, is a formal colony that traces its history and many of its settlers to the old country, that is, Great Britain. And when it gained its independence from Britain, it naturally fell under the influence of its large, powerful neighbor to the south, with which it has so much in common. Now, its policy of actively encouraging immigration and assisting different cultures to maintain their distinctive languages and identities means that the forging of a Canadian identity that applies to everyone continues to be a major challenge. Many people are familiar with the notion that American society is considered as a melting pot. The melting pot conveys the idea of successive waves of immigrations coming to the country and throwing off their old customs, languages, and traditions in favor of new identity. 
In contrast, Canada, also a nation of immigrations, is usually described as being a mosaic. When the Britain allowed the defeated French the right to retain their own language, religion, and customs in Canada, both French speaker and English speaker were all considered Canadian. When new settlers brought their different customs and ways of life to their new Canadian home, they did not throw them off completely, but adapted them to the new environment. Thus, Canada, it is felt, resembles a mosaic of different cultures which overlap but do not overwhelm each other. When we talk about the history of Canada, actually, it is a relatively young country. Before the European discovery, Canada was populated by American Indian and Inuit tribes. The name Canada is said to have derived from the Huron world, Kanata, meaning a village of settlement. In 1497, an Italian sea captain, John Cabot, sailed from Bristol, Britain, searching for a new route to Asia. Instead, this voyage led to the discovery of eastern shores of Canada, which Cabot claimed as Newfoundland. The French exploration of Canada began in 1534. Jacques Cartier, a French navigator, also in attempt to find new routes to the Oriental countries, explored the Canadian coast and the St. Lawrence River in 1534, 1535, 1541, and 1542. And he visited what is today Quebec City and Montreal. When the European explorers returned home, they brought back the news that their new found land was abundant in fish and other natural resources. Consequently, throughout the rest of the 16th century, European fishing fleets continued to make almost an annual visit to the eastern shores of Canada. Thus, trading with local Indian began to develop at the fishing site. At the same time, with the development of unorganized traffic in furs, the Canadian fur trade, later fur monopoly, gradually began to take shape. In the early 1600s, the Britain and France founded permanent settlements in Canada. In 1608, France founded a colony at what is now Quebec City, the root of French Canada. Through the 17th century, French colonists extended from the St. Lawrence River to the Great Lakes, and from there to the Great Plains and the Mississippi Valley. Later, with the rapid growth of English colonies along the Atlantic seaboard, Britain and France soon became rivals in the gradual conquest of those parts of North America, which hadn't been claimed by the Spanish. The decisive struggle took place during the 1750s, when the famous Seven Years' War started. After the war, France lost all its colonies, and the whole Canada came under the British control. The British named the French colony on the St. Lawrence River the province of Quebec, and it still allows the French colonists to stay on. Britain faced immediate problems in the vast territory. In order to deal with the French population, in 1774, the British Parliament passed the Quebec Act, which granted the people of Quebec linguistic and the religious freedom and guaranteed the use of French civil law and a British criminal law. The Quebec Act 
was the first important milestone in a long line of efforts to cope with the differences between the French and the British people. After the American War of Independence, thousands of American refugees who called themselves loyalists and claimed to remain loyal to Britain made their way north to settle in such areas as present-day southern Ontario and laid the base of English-speaking Canada. Due to the protect of these colonists, with the Constitutional Act in 1791, Canada was split into Upper Canada, English-speaking Ontario, and Lower Canada, French-speaking Quebec. Both colonies have limited self-government and political organization. Consequently, revolt broke out in 1837 because of economic and the religious discontent between the British and the French communities. After the rebellion were put down in 1841, Upper Canada and the Lower Canada united as the British colony, the province of Canada. Canada's road to political self-government began with the British North American Act in 1867 also known as the Constitutional Act, which created the self-governing dominion of Canada. After Confederation, under the leadership of the nation's major political parties, Canada experienced rapid growth in the following decades. After the First World War, Canada's economy and business advanced significantly, so that the country became an important member among the nations in the world. During the Second World War, Canada's geographic location protected it from the wartime destruction. After the war, tremendous development took place in industry and agriculture, and Canada emerged as the world's fourth largest industrial nation. Canada is a constitutional monarchy with a federal system of parliamentary government. The Canadian government consists of three major parts, the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. The political system under which modern Canada operates is known as the Westminster system. Since Canada's political structure is modeled after that of Great Britain and the United States, it can be described as both a federation like the United States and a constitutional monarchy like Great Britain. The Parliament of Canada consists of House of Commons, whose 308 members are elected, and the Senate, whose 105 members are appointed by the Governor-General on the advice of the Prime Minister. The Senate functions primarily to investigate, review government legislation, and debate key national and regional issues. The Prime Minister is often the leader of the majority party in the Parliament and selects the ministers who make up the Cabinet. Together, they are responsible to the House of Commons. As a self-governing member of the Commonwealth, Canada recognizes the British monarch as the official head of the state while all government actions are carried out in the king's or queen's name. It is, in fact, the people of Canada, through their elected representatives, who have the authority to exercise the power. In the Canadian parliamentary system, the Governor-General holds the highest position and is theoretically the source of executive power. It is the Governor-General's responsibility to summon the House of Commons and the Senate, to give royal assent to all federal laws passed by the House, to open and end sessions of Parliament, 
and to dissolve Parliament before an election. In practice, however, the Governor General is only the symbolic executive who can only act on the advice of the Canadian Prime Minister and the Cabinet. The courts in Canada are organized in a four level structure. The Supreme Court serves as the final court of appeals in Canada. As the country's highest court, it hears both civil and criminal appeals from decision of the Court of Appeals in all the provinces and the territories, as well as the federal court system headed by the Federal Court of Appeals. The Supreme Court also plays a special role as advisor to the federal government on questions concerning the constitutional and controversial or complicated areas of private and public laws. The next levels done consists of the federal courts and the various provincial courts. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.